many an- analogies. You see the analogies uh, um, of of the Trinity. For example, you have water, ice, and steam. They're all the same element, but they're just in different forms. Okay, so that's how to understand. Uh, Last year during my homily at Mass, I talked about a Snickers bar. You know, you have the nuts, you have the caramel, and you have the chocolate, and together they form the one Snickers bar. But, and then you have an apple, you know, you have the peel, you have the fruit, and then you have the seeds. They're all one. So there are different analogies, but Analogies are finite. It's and the Trinity is like water, ice, and steam. It is like the clover. It is like the apple. It is like the Snickers bar. But it is not like any of those either. You see that that's and it says nothing about God. It says it's just the Trinity is like. Now I think this is a a basic misconception: is that we somehow think just because something is a Trinity, uh, sorry, it's just because something is a mystery, it doesn't mean we cannot understand it. We can, we, what by mystery means that we cannot fully grasp it. It is beyond us. But we can, with some study, with some intellect, actually understand the Trinity. Now, there are many ways to try and understand it, but I'm just going to try. I'm going to try and explain this to you. So mark where we are right now on the things, because you might need to come back to this. To, to listen to this about two or three times until you m- maybe grasp this, okay? So, let's try and understand this. Ultimately, the Trinity is about communication. The Trinity is about imagery, okay? So, um, for example, Bishop Barron, um, um, Robert Barron, talks about um, the communication of elements. For example... Um, all levels of existence communicate. For example, some animately, some inanimately. So some consciously, some not consciously. So for example, a rock. How does a rock communicate? Well, it, it leaves an image of itself, say it's in the sand, and um, it's there and then the sand comes over and all of a sudden you pull the, the rock out and it's left an image of itself. So there are things, so even inanimate objects communicate, leave marks, leave images of themselves. Then there are, like, if you go up a level, you have plants. How do plants leave images of themselves? Through seeds. They sow seeds, more seeds, and all of a sudden there's an, an image of what was before. Uh, by, again, the, the, the plant um, seeding and, and, and growing another plant. Then you go up another level. Animals. A chook lays an egg and all of a sudden it creates an exact image of itself through its offspring. You know, there's, so it's still also like the rock leaves its footprints. It's still like the, the plant has sowed the seeds. But now in this upper level, it creates a perfect image, living image of itself and moving image of itself and also thinking it. So they think the same. They desire the same instinct. Okay, so you go up a level. But then, now you go up another level, and that is the human being, human race. So we can leave images of ourselves through our footsteps in the sand. We could leave images of ourselves through offspring. We could leave images of ourselves um, through um, culture. Like, for example, my children think the same way that I do, the way we influence others, the way we... And so people start to think the same and act the same as us. But also we leave images of ourselves, which is different to any other species, through the way we communicate. For example, as I'm talking to you now, I'm leaving, I'm giving, I'm projecting an image of what is in my mind, what is in my intellect. I'm projecting an image of what is in my heart. When I go and give talks to students, they hear my heart, they hear the microphone to my heartbeat, and that's an image of what is in my heart, and they get to hear that. So that is the way we as human beings also um, communicate. But so we we communicate in different levels. But, um, and so we create images of what is in our mind. But you see, our our mind is imperfect. Our mind is imperfect. So when I, even when I'm talking to you, you're not going to get the perfect image of what is in my mind because my communication is imperfect, imperfect. And not only that, your understanding is imperfect. So you interpret it through your own level of intellect. You interpret it through your own understanding, through your own biases, through your own pain and joys, 
so through your own triggers so the communication is there there's an image going but it, it's imperfect okay but now let's go up an other level let's go to god god you know, communicates perfectly there's and not only that he receives communication perfectly so when there's a communication from God, love towards others and towards and, and receiving of love, there is no filter, absolutely no filter. It's perfect. And it's, it's um, so it's communicated perfectly. Now, when God communicates love, when we communicate, for example, there's like an image, you know, we have, um, we stand, I stand in front of a mirror and I project an image of myself. But it is an imperfect image because it's two dimensional for one. The second thing is that it's an image, but it has no, the image has no life of its own. It's just a reflection of what I am. But God, being the perfect communicator, communicates an image of himself. That is perfect. So when I look in the mirror, I create an image of myself, but it, the image has no will and it has no intellect. It has no personality. It cannot. It has no mind of its own because it's just a reflection of me. But when God communicates, here's where it's difficult. And this is where I'm going to jump a little bit and where it might be difficult to understand. Now, when God communicates, he communicates so perfectly and the image and the imago, the, the, the icon, is so perfect, the communication so perfect, that it becomes a perfect reflection of what God is. So, and a perfect reflection is not only a two-dimensional, but it's three-dimensional. It's not only a reflection of his, uh, of, of, of what is, of the mind and the intellect being reflected, but it is so perfect that the mind and intellect is also reflected and it's also personified, also comes into being. This is crazy and complicated and philosophical. Okay? So what happens is that perfect image of the way God looks and reflects and communicates himself become, comes into being through the Son. So the Father's reflection image is the Son. Now, that's the mirror, that's the perfect communication, like the, like the rock imprints itself in the sand, God imprints himself in the sun, but perfectly. So there's, uh, there's a will, there's an intellect, there's a personality there. Now, where there's a perfect image of oneself, there's perfect love. So basically, God perfectly loves the image, the image perfectly loves the other, the, the, the communicator. And so there's an exchange of love. And, and what is that exchange of love? That exchange of love is the Holy Spirit, you see? And so um, I think it was Fulton Sheen that said that the, the father and the son looked at each other and they sighed. <sighs> that sigh of love, that sigh, that breath of love, that ruach of love is the Holy Spirit. So there's the Father, the perfect icon, which is the Son, and the exchange of love between them, which is the Holy Spirit. And that perfect love is also personified. It's also a perfect image of that love. And so this is the, 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 this love, the Ruch Kadosh, the, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Breath of God, the Holy Sigh, of God is the Holy Spirit. So you have Father who reflects the perfect icon, which is the Son, which has its his own will and intellect, and the Holy Spirit that is made alive, that is personified, not made alive because they're not created. It's just by necessity in being, they boom, come to being at once. By It's necessary for God. And again, this is a whole other philosophical level. And together they become the Holy Trinity. 